I want to welcome everyone uh, to this hearing and especially welcome the FCC Chairman and the Commissioners to our hearing today. And thank you for your thoughtful testimony and the time that each of you took to meet individually with me to discuss process reform ideas that could improve the transparency and accountability of the Federal Communications Commission. As I told the Chairman, and as I think I've shared with each Commissioner, and as Ms. Eshu and I have discussed and agreed uh, as late as uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, a discussion about reforming process is not and should not become an exercise in partisanship or serve as a cloak to attack present or past commissions or present or past commissioners. That's not what we're about here. As I'm sure uh, everyone will notice, uh, we have only four witness chairs filled today um, in light of Commissioner Baker's announcement Wednesday. I'd like to thank her for her many years of public service, not only as a commissioner, but also in helping us complete the uh, DTV transition while she was serving as uh, the head of the NTIA. It was no small undertaking, and she has done good service to the country, and I wish her well in her new role. Turning to today's topic, it is our responsibility to review how independent agencies to whom we have delegated authority and over which we have jurisdiction conduct the public's business. At times, the FCC succumbed to practices under both Democratic and Republican chairmen that weakened decision-making and jeopardized public confidence. While Chairman Janikowski and some of his predecessors have taken steps to improve process, we've all witnessed how process and procedures from one chairman can change dramatically under another. One FCC is open and transparent. The next can be closed and dysfunctional. So the time is ripe to codify best practices to ensure consistency from issue to issue and commission to commission. Many of my colleagues on this subcommittee have worked on reform ideas in the past, and some have proposed changes in bill form today. We will consider those as well. Now to kick things off, here are seven items to think about. First, the FCC could be required to start new rulemaking proceedings with a notice of inquiry rather than a notice of proposed rulemaking. And NPRM presumes that regulation is needed. The FCC could first examine the state of the relevant markets, services, and technologies. Even when regulation may be appropriate, the FCC is unlikely to craft as useful a proposal without first gathering preliminary information. Here's another idea. The FCC does not always publish the text of proposed rules for public comment before adopting final rules. Providing specific text will allow for more constructive input and a better end product. Crafting proposed rules should not be difficult if there's genuine need, and the FCC has started with a notice of inquiry. Third, finite timelines for resolution of matters would be helpful. Parties in the public should have some sense of when resolution will come. Fourth, the FCC now makes information available about which draft items are circulating before the commissioners. The FCC could be required to provide additional information, such as a list of all unfinished items at the Commission, the date the items were initiated, their current status, and expected date of completion, a report card, if you will. Fifth, a bipartisan majority of commissioners um, could, uh, other than the chairman, could be allowed to initiate items to prevent a chairman from stopping consensus items. Sixth. The President's memorandum for the heads of executive departments and agencies, quote, regulatory flexibility, small business and job creation, close quote, requires executive agencies to conduct cost-benefit analyses before adopting regulations. The memorandum does not apply, however, to independent agencies like the FCC. We could remedy that by requiring the FCC to identify actual consumer harm and conduct economic, market, and cost-benefit analyses before adopting any regulation. Seventh. The FCC's transaction review standards are vague and susceptible to abuse. Parties with a pending transaction should not feel pressure to accept voluntary, quote unquote, conditions on the deal or to curtail their advocacy in other proceedings. These concerns are neither new nor of concern to only one party. Indeed, my good friend from Michigan, the Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Dingell, observed in a March 2000 hearing that there is, and I quote Mr. Dingell, great need to address and reform the way the FCC handles its merger reviews. These are a remarkable exercise in arrogance and the behavior of the Commission, oft times by reason of delay and other matters, approaches what might well be defined as not just arrogance but extortion, close quote, from Mr. Dingell. 
So the concerns of Mr. Dingell raised then have been borne out with increasing frequency over the last decade. To address this, the FCC could be prohibited from adopting any conditions unless they're narrowly tailored to any transaction-specific harm. To prevent the FCC from using transactions to, com uh, to commence industry-wide changes it could not otherwise adopt, the FCC could be required to show statutory authority for the conditions outside the transaction review provisions of the Act. These suggestions are simply meant as a conversation starter. I look forward to additional suggestions from my colleagues on the subcommittee, the full committee, and from the public and the commissioners themselves and the chairman. And on that note, I yield back uh, the balance of my time and would recognize the uh, uh, ranking uh, member on the subcommittee, Ms. Eshoo from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to you, and uh, welcome to Chairman Janikowski and the members of the uh, Federal Communications Commission. It's good to see you. Uh, today's hearing is a, um, is, it's an important opportunity uh, to hear from the FCC chairman and the commissioners on what is already working well, uh, because there are things that are working well, and where there are opportunities to improve the uh, Federal Communications Commission. We should work together as a committee to subject ideas and suggestions to healthy scrutiny and determine what reforms can be embraced to better serve the public good. That's why we are all here. And I think sometimes that gets lost in the complexity and the layers of things. Uh, we are here to serve the public good. Under G uh, uh, Chairman Janikowski's tenure, the Commission has taken several key steps to increase openness, transparency, and greater interaction with the public. Uh, the Spectrum Dashboard, the new Expartive rules, uh, the, um, uh, the growing use of social media like Twitter and Facebook are just a few ways that the FCC has become more responsive to the needs of consumers and businesses. But there's always much more that can be done. And I welcome steps that will ensure that the Commission can operate as a modern 21st century federal agency. Earlier this year, I introduced the FCC Collaboration Act uh, with our colleagues, uh, Representatives uh, Shimkus and Doyle. Uh, this is a simple bipartisan reform measure uh, which would modify the current rules which prohibit more than two commissioners from talking to each other outside of an official public meeting. Uh, now, why is this important? In an agency that deals with uh, highly technical issues like spectrum and universal service, FCC commissioners uh, should be able to collaborate and benefit from the years of experience uh, that each one brings to the table. We should move uh, this bill forward in a timely manner and get it done. Uh, I welcome examining other ideas as well, like the FCC Commissioner's uh, Technical Resource Enhancement Act, a bill introduced in the last Congress that would allow each commissioner to appoint uh, an electrical engineer or a computer scientist to their staff. Similar to the Collaboration Act, I'm open to looking at other ways to ensure that each commissioner is equipped to evaluate the complex uh, technology and telecommunications issues that the FCC is faced with today. What would concern me would be proposals which diminish the Commission's ability to protect the public interest and to preserve competition in the telecommunications marketplace. The FCC has a critical role to play in evaluating proposed mergers, ensuring that broadband is universally deployed, and that the market for voice and data service is actually competitive. To stay in touch with a rapidly changing industry, the FCC, I think, should make it part of its core mission to visit companies both small and large. Uh, last month, Commissioner Copps joined me uh, in my congressional district, and we visited several companies headquartered in Silicon Valley. We learned a great deal. Uh, I extend a similar invitation to each commissioner uh, because I believe these types of meetings with entrepreneurs, engineers, and other technology experts are central to understanding the issues you work on every day. So thank you again for being here today. I really look forward to this hearing, and I also look forward to hearing your testimony and your fresh thinking. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thanks, gentlelady. Uh, and we want to thank you all for coming. 
and now we're going to recess for about an hour, unfortunately. <laughs> um, there is a series of votes on the House floor. We think it could take upwards of an hour, so why don't we plan to uh, just reconvene at 1040. And with that, we stand wow. in recess. I'm going to call the subcommittee on uh, communications technology back to order. I want to thank my uh, colleague from Illinois for his courtesy in yielding to Mr. Waxman, who has another engagement at 1130. So uh, we'll go out of our normal sequence on uh, opening statements and uh, go back to the, uh, the Democratic side of the aisle. And Mr. Waxman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I particularly want to thank uh, Mr. Shimkus for his courtesy. I'd like to welcome uh, Chairman Janikowski, as well as Commissioners Copps, McDowell, and Clyburn back to the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. We understand how much effort goes into preparing to testify before Congress, and we greatly appreciate your participation. The topic of FCC reform is not new to this committee. As one reporter's account of an October 28, 1999 hearing recalls, quote, the FCC was criticized for its slow pace of institutional reform, its handling of the E-rate and universal service, its exercise of antitrust merger review authority, its delay in completing antitrust merger reviews, and its imposition of conditions on mergers. End quote. Well, today's hearing will take us back to the future as we vi revisit many of these same issues. At the outset, let me say that Chairman Janikowski should be commended for his significant efforts and commitment to improving agency operations and boosting employee morale. Since he became chairman, the agency has increased transparency, expanded opportunities for public input, and improved information sharing with other commissioners and the public. The agency now includes more details on proposed rules in notices of proposed rulemaking, makes adopted rules available to the public more quickly, and has revamped its ex parte rules to enhance openness and transparency. These efforts have been made better by the thoughtful bipartisan suggestion of his fellows, com fellow commissioners. And it's clear that today the FCC is a much better place to work. According to the 2010 OPM employee survey, the FCC was the most improved agency in the federal government. I also want to commend Subcommittee Chairman Walden for looking at this issue in a nonpartisan manner. He has sought input from all of the commissioners and Republican and Democratic committee members, and he is uh, committed to explore proposed process reforms in detail before we proceed toward possible legislation. If the committee does develop legislation regarding FCC reform, we should be guided by a few basic questions about each proposed change to ensure that we are promoting smart regulation. First, does the proposed change create an undue burden on the FCC? When we impose statutory requirements of any kind, we need to be wary of burdening the agency with re compliance requirements. Second, are we undermining agency flexibility to act quickly and efficiently in the public interest? If we put prescriptive process requirements in statute, we can end up promoting slower, not faster decision making. And third, are we requiring additional process for valid reasons, we must not impose procedural hurdles for their own sake. Fourth, are we making procedural changes in an attempt to address outcomes with which we don't agree? For example, if we limit the ability of the agency to negotiate voluntary commitments related to mergers, are we also willing to accept that certain mergers may then be rejected outright? So, some might view conditions as unfair, while others might see them as critical trade-offs that allow transactions that might otherwise fail to go forward. And finally, why the FCC? Are we imposing process reforms on the FCC that it should apply to all federal agencies? If not, what is our basis for treating the FCC differently? I look forward to hearing our panels, uh, a panel address these issues and to receiving their advice about how to improve the FCC. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back uh, uh, any uh, other members wish me to yield to them? If not, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his kind comments and look forward to uh, continuing our discussions on these matters, and I, I appreciate your comments on the principles. Um, I'm now going to yield. We have five minutes uh, on our side, and so I know we have several speakers, and so if we could kind of work a minute apiece, I think that would work out or slightly a little, not much over that. So at this time, I would uh, start with Mr. Stearns. Uh, and recognize him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for this hearing. Uh, I think uh, the ranking member, Mr. Waxman, has pointed out that uh, it's 
the agency has come a long way. I think it has, but in this area of uh, the Internet and technology, I think there's still a long way to go for it, and I think there's a litany of uh, necessary improvements, and I think this hearing will show that. For example, the merger review process, I think, she needs to be examined. Although the FCC internal shot clock to act on mergers is six months, uh, XM Cyrus took over 16 months, Mr. Chairman, and Comcast NBCU took nearly 11. Uh, and so uh, I think in a rapidly evolving market here, it's un uncertainty sometimes can create uh, havoc uh, for markets and deadlines for FCC action coupled with ensuring merger reviews are handled in a transparent way is important without uh, endless strands of non-merger specific conditions attached, I think would provide uh, future certainty. So the bottom line, I think the agency could improve and I hope we can uh, move forward. Thank you. Now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, we want to thank Commissioner Baker for her time and hopefully we can expeditiously get her replaced to fill the commission. I know that's all, all everyone's desire. Uh, Chairman, we appreciate the, uh, the movement on reform. That's something that uh, with the new technology and new age, uh, that's important. And we know there are steps being made in, in that direction. And I've um, enjoyed my, my time uh, working with Commissioner Copps and, of course, uh, Anna Eshoo. And um, on the uh, Sunshine Bill, it just doesn't make sense. Um, maybe three can't speak together, but to have two not be able to speak of the commissioners. Uh, Chairman Walden, I spoke on the floor. Um, I think it's something that we can move expeditiously. Of course, I'm not the chairman, so I will defer to his wisdom and guidance. But uh, based Spot. upon the last election, even in the cycle, I said, we're, you know, I think the public's tired of comprehensive big bills. We ought to move things that we can move uh, clearly, concisely, and defend. Um, and maybe we'll be there at the end if other things can't be agreed upon, but uh, I've been, uh, the, the chairman has agreed to take a good look at what we're doing and hopefully merge those with other things that are not also in agreement and, and produce a good bill. So with that, I thank him, and I'll, I'll probably ask some questions on that if I'm not on a plane, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. I recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of you. Procedurally, I do have some questions uh, about license transfers and decency complaints and FCC voting procedures. But I think the biggest problem that I have and what I want to discuss with you today is what I see is um, your overreach, going beyond your statutory authority. And, a, and you do it without consequence. And the chairman and I have discussed our disagreement on uh, net neutrality and regulation of the Internet. But I think that there's also overreach to other things like data roaming and an agency scheme, what I think is a clever scheme to socialize our mobile networks. And I think that as you look at privacy, and we'll talk about this a little bit today, that the FCC is moving into areas where it should not be with issues like privacy. So um, I'm one of those that think it think it's time to maybe rein the agency in a little bit and have a discussion about what your structure should look like. So thank you for being here to participate. And I yield back. Uh, Mr. Bass or Mr. Gingry, do you have any comments? Mr. Chairman, if I could just make a brief comment. Yes. I want to thank all four of you for being here today. And I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to stay long enough to ask the question, but I was hoping that the chairman uh, would comment on this uh, GPS slash, you know, the spectrum issue as to whether or not it would be appropriate for that decision to be one that the commission itself makes rather than be done through rule. There are significant potential issues associated with this which need to be uh, aired, and I'm hopeful that the commission will have a process that will allow for both sides in this debate to have their uh, views considered and assure that the proper decision is made by the agency, I mean by the uh, commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back the time. All time on our side has now been yielded back, same on the other. So with that, I'd like to welcome the uh, chairman of the uh, Federal Communications Commission, Mr. Janikowski. We appreciate your testimony and your work at reform, um, and we welcome your, your comments this morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, members of the committee. Thank you for holding uh, this hearing uh, on FCC process reform. 
At the FCC, we're focused on harnessing the power of communications technology to benefit all Americans, to grow our economy, create jobs, enhance our competitiveness, and unleash innovation. On my first day as chairman, I told the FCC staff that whether we can achieve these goals depends on how our agency works. That's why the FCC's processes and operations are important, as Chairman Walden has said, and it's why I've made it a priority to improve the way the FCC does business. Our approach to reform rests on a number of core principles, efficiency and fiscal responsibility, accountability and transparency, reliance on facts and data, on the power of technology to improve agency operations, and on the benefits of collaboration. To drive our reform efforts, I appointed a special counsel for FCC reform immediately after my confirmation, and I hired a new managing director with experience running a multi-billion dollar private sector P&L to help lead our reform efforts. My fellow commissioners have been vital partners in this effort. Commissioner Copps made FCC reform a priority when he was acting chairman. Commissioner McDowell has raised issues uh, with me on which we've taken positive action, and Commissioner Clyburn has taken a lead and has helped us make real progress on our process and relationships with the states. In the past two years working together, we've increased efficiency, increased transparency, increased collaboration, and increased the effectiveness of the FCC. I'm proud of our progress, and I'm pleased that in the past two years, 95% of commission actions have been unanimous and bipartisan. My written testimony includes many examples of the reforms implemented in the last two years. As John Wooden said, we shouldn't confuse activity with accomplishment, so I'd like to use my limited time to highlight some of the real results of our reform efforts. In the last two years, we've reduced the time between the vote on a commission decision and its public release from an average of 14 days to three days uh, and to one day in most cases. We've increased the number of notices of proposed rulemakings that publish the text of proposed rules from 38% to 85%. We've eliminated many outdated regulations. Two months ago, we identified 20 sets of unnecessary data collection requirements to be eliminated, and just yesterday, the Commission identified and eliminated an additional five data collection requirements. We have acted on over 95% of transactions within the 180-day shot clock period. With respect to major transactions, we've cut down the review time by more than 100 days. We've reduced our broadcast application backlog by 30% and our satellite application backlog by 89%. We've broken down internal silos at the FCC and increased internal communications. We've reformed our video relay service, a reform that has already saved taxpayers about $250 million. We're saving millions of dollars by harnessing technology to improve the agency's operations, including by consolidating multiple licensing systems and reducing data centers. A leading commentator said the commission has gone from one of the worst to one of the best in its use of online tools to serve the public and all stakeholders. Just yesterday, we relaunched FCC.gov after receiving and responding to broad input on our beta launch. We've launched a public spectrum dashboard. A few weeks ago, we had the first joint blog post in FCC history with all FCC commissioners focusing on the importance of reforming the Universal Service Fund. We've held more than 85 public forums with active participation from commissioners and for the first time have made staff-led public workshops a routine part of commission work. We've adopted reforms of our ex parte process to increase transparency, reforms of our voting process to increase efficiency, and reforms of our filing process to increase effectiveness. Our national broadband plan has been lauded as, quote, a model for other nations and has been praised for its process and its substance. OPM's government-wide survey of federal employees identified the FCC as the most improved place to work in the federal government. I thank Mr. Waxman for mentioning that. And just last week, the FCC, the FCC team that worked on the National Broadband Plan was nominated for a Service to America Medal, the most prestigious independent award for America's civil servants. I'm proud of what we have achieved. The Commission is working effectively. We are moving in the right direction. And I thank my fellow commissioners, as well as the FCC's employees, who have been instrumental in making this possible, as well as the many members of, of this committee who have, over the years and in my time, offered very constructive suggestions to improve our processes. Of course, there's more we can do to improve performance, and I'm committed to continuing our efforts at reform. Making the FCC work is important because the FCC's mission is important. It matters to our economy, to our global competitiveness, and to the quality of life of all Americans. I look forward to working with the subcommittee on these important issues. I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chairman. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll get that high-technology ringing device off over there somewhere in the corner. Uh, we're also streaming, if you notice on the video screens here, all of your data is streaming over your faces, too. Right? <laughs>
it's part of what happens in repacking and yeah um if you don't get it right so it's great to be the technology there oh, so we'll see if it quits anyway we want to go now to uh, uh the senior member of the federal communications commission uh, by length of service, I'll only approach it that way. Uh, we appreciate your service to the country and on the Federal Communications Commission, Mr. Copps, and we welcome your testimony and comments. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this important meeting on FCC reform and for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. As Chairman Janikowski has uh, explained, and many of you have already noted, we have had real and measurable accomplishments toward FCC reform. Uh, under this current commission, and I am proud of those. I know there are many other ideas and proposals you will want to discuss this morning, and I'm happy to comment on any of them. But in my brief time now, I want to mention just three ideas that I find especially important. First and foremost, please allow the commissioners to talk to one another. That seems a strange request in a town fueled by dialogue and debate, but in an FCC world, when three or more of us are ever together outside of a public meeting, we must get lockjaw. We cannot mention one iota of policy or substance, float one idea for resolving a crisis, or suggest any alternative path for addressing a problem. This has not only irked me for years, but troubled me greatly because it's like sending a football team into a huddle and prohibiting the players from talking to one another. That's the FCC under the closed meeting rule, the silent huddle. So the first thing I want to do this morning is to applaud Congressman uh, Anna Eshoo and Congressman John Shimkus and Congressman Mike Doyle for the introduction of their FCC Collaboration Act. This proposed legislation is a modest, common sense, and much needed reform to modify the closed meeting rule that prohibits more than two commissioners from ever talking to one another unless it is in a public meeting. I have spoken about the need for this reform for many years before this subcommittee. I'm hopeful this will be the year when legislation is finally enacted. I have seen firsthand for the, the pernicious and unintended consequences of this prohibition, stifling collaborative discussions among colleagues, delaying timely decision making, discouraging collegiality, and shortchanging consumers in the public interest. Elected representatives, cabinet officials, judges, even the cardinals of my Catholic Church have the opportunity for face-to-face -face discussion before making important issues. I see no reason why the FCC commissioners should not have the same opportunity to reason together especially when balanced, as this legislation is, with specific safeguards designed to preserve transparency. If it's good enough for Congress, the courts, and Holy Mother Catholic Church, it ought to be good enough for the FCC. Reaching agreement on the complex issues pending, pending before us is difficult enough in the best of circumstances, but it's infinitely more so when we cannot even talk about them among ourselves. Each of the five commissioners brings to the FCC special experiences and unique talents that we cannot fully leverage without communicating directly with one another. This act is a prudent, balanced proposal that recognizes the benefits of permitting the Commission to do its business collectively while maintaining full transparency of the process. Enactment of this legislation would, in my mind, constitute as major a reform of Commission procedures as any that I can contemplate. It doesn't just protect the public interest, it advances the public interest, and it's number one on my list. My second suggestion is let's get the FCC out of Washington and on the road more frequently. I mean the full commission, all the commissioners. We live too much in an isolated inside the Beltway culture. We see the usual players make the same speeches every year and attain, attend the same functions and events, and that's fine up to a point, but if it comes at the expense of letting America see the FCC, and letting the FCC see America, it's not so good. Our deliberations would surely and greatly benefit from taking the FCC outside Washington, D.C. and put it on the road so it could directly hear from average Americans. The Commission holds an open meeting each month, and I so see no reason why for at least a few months out of the year we couldn't conduct our open meetings in places like Bend or Benton Harbor or Boston or Austin or Mountain View. In communications, every American is a stakeholder, and each of us is affected in so many important ways by our media policy, spectrum allocations, and universal service, just to name a few big ticket items on our agenda. The idea here is not just that people would see the commission, but that the commission would see the people and gain a greater understanding of the impact of our decisions on American consumers. It's just better communications, and after all, communications is our middle name. Third, and this is related to what I just suggested, we need to encourage more input into our deliberations by what I have called our non-traditional stakeholders. Although we hear often, sometimes every day, from the big interests with their armies of lawyers and lobbyists, we hear much less from everyone else. 
all those consumers and citizens who don't have a lobbyist or lawyer in town to represent them, but who nevertheless have to live with the consequences of what we do in Washington. I've devoted considerable time during my years at the Commission to open our doors to the full panoply of American stakeholders, including minorities, rural Americans, the various disabilities communities, Native Americans, consumer and advocacy organizations, and also educational institutions. We were designed to be a consumer protection agency. Let's get the skinny from those who consume what you and I do in Washington, D.C. Another area where we need to see more progress in partnering is in the federal, state, local governmental relationship. I believe more of this kind of interaction was envisioned and encouraged by the Telecommunications Act of 1996. As we embark upon the formidable challenge of revamping universal service and intercarrier compensation, it is vitally important that we are sharing data, sharing ideas, and sharing responsibility with our colleagues at all levels of government. I commend the chairman for moving us forward in this regard and also my colleague, Commissioner Clyburn, for the excellent work she has done to reinvigorate our partnerships with the states as chair of the federal state joint boards. We need always to be thinking about how to build upon the experiences and knowledge that exist in such abundance at all levels of government. Let me say that this present commission has made many and impressive important strides to increase transparency, to work collaboratively with all stakeholders, and to hold workshops both inside and outside the nation's capital. The chairman's statement recounts many of these, and I commend him for the progress that has been made. My point is this work is never done, and there's much more that we can still do. There are years, decades of inside the Beltway-itis to make up for, and this demands some fundamental reorientation of the Commission. We can talk about deadlines, shot clocks, what's an NOI versus an NPRM, and those are all relevant matters to discuss, but above them all is giving consumers and citizens confidence that their voices are being heard, their suggestions given credence, and knowing that their Commission exists to serve the public interest, a term that by my rough count appears some 112 times in the Telecommunications Act. That is our lodestar, and we need to keep our fix on that lodestar every minute of every day. Thank you for convening this conversation, and I look forward to your comments and suggestions for the betterment of the good ship FCC. Mr. Copps, thank you, as always, for your, uh, your comments and suggestions. I go now to uh, Commissioner McDowell. We welcome you. We appreciate your uh, thoughtful addition to this discussion, and we welcome your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Walden, and uh, Ranking Member Eschew, all members of the committee. And I also see a familiar face sitting behind Mr. Stearns over there, uh, Brooke Erickson, uh, my former law clerk. And uh, now that you're my overseer, I really am hoping I was a nice boss. So, uh, <laughs> but as you know, Congress created the FCC in 1934, almost uh, 77 years ago. In that year, Babe Ruth signed a contract for an eye-popping $35,000 a year. Donald Duck made his movie debut. The average new house cost less than $6,000. The entire federal budget was only $6.5 billion, and a gallon of gas cost 10 cents. And my, have, how times have changed. Although a few amendments have been made to the laws of the commission, uh, the, the laws uh, that the commission operates under since then, many of the regulatory legacies from 1934 remain in place. The technologies we take for granted in today's communications marketplace were unimaginable to even the most creative of science fiction writers when existing mandates were written. Against this backdrop, it is fitting uh, for this committee to examine ways to reform the FCC to make it more efficient and relevant to modern realities. I operate under the philosophy that Congress should tell us what to do and not the other way around, but given your solicitation of suggestions, I will start by raising several possible statutory changes to improve the FCC before moving on to possible uh, procedural forms that we could uh, effectuate. 21st century consumers want to have the freedom to enjoy their favorite applications and content when and where they choose. Whether such material arrives over coaxial cable, copper wires, fiber, or radio waves is of little consequence to most consumers so long as the market's supply of products and services satisfies demand. Legacy statutory constructs, however, have created market-distorting legal stovepipes based on the regulatory history of particular delivery platforms. While consumers demand that functionalities and technologies converge, Regulators and business people alike are forced to make decisions based on whether a business model fits into titles one, two, three, six, or none of the above. As Congress contemplates FCC reform, it may want to consider adopting an approach that is more focused on preventing concentrations and abuses of market power that result in consumer harm. Furthermore, ideas from outside the Commission also deserve serious consideration. For instance, Randy May, the president of the Free State Foundation, has called for 
building on the deregulatory bent of Sections 10 and 11 of the Telecom Act of 1996 by adding an evidentiary presumption during periodic regulatory reviews that would enhance the likelihood of the Commission reaching a deregulatory decision. With respect to procedural ideas, almost two and a half years ago, I sent to my colleague, then Acting Chairman Mike Copps, uh, a public letter detailing some ideas to improve our agency's effectiveness. He and I agree on many reform ideas, such as modernizing, uh, the modernization of the cumbersome and outdated sunshine rules that prevent more than two of us from discussing uh, commission business outside of a public meeting. Later, in July of 2009, after uh, Julius Janikowski became a commission colleague as well, I sent him an updated letter with additional ideas and suggestions within existing statutory constructs. Time does not allow me to uh, enumerate all of them, so I've attached the, these letters as part of my testimony and respectfully request to be included in the record. I'm delighted to report that some reforms have already been implemented. For example, many stale or ill-advised commission action items awaiting votes contained on what we call the circulation list have been weeded out. A portion of the backlog of the 1.4 million broadcast indecency complaints that were defective on their face have been dismissed. And the FCC now relies more on electronic internal communications rather than paper deliveries. Going forward, I'm hopeful that other FCC reform suggestions will be carried out as well. I've long called for a full and public operational, financial, and ethics audit of everything connected to the FCC, including the Universal Service Administrative Company, also known as USAC. The erroneous payment rate in the high cost fund alone has been far too high, and we may need to make fundamental changes to fix the problem. Chairman Janikowski has made good progress on ensuring that notices of proposed rulemaking contain actual proposed rules. I applaud his efforts. I would encourage improving the process further by codifying this requirement in our rules. The Commission should include proper market power analyses to justify new rules in notices of proposed rulemaking. If a market power analysis is not appropriate, the FCC should explain why. When regulated entities are under scrutiny for alleged violations of our rules, such as broadcasters being investigated for airing indecent material, often they are not notified in a timely manner that of the investigation or its effects on other matters before the Commission, such as license renewals. Similarly, entities are not always informed of when they have been cleared of wrongdoing. More transparency and better communication in this area would not only be a matter of appropriate due process, but simple good government as well. To promote collegiality and efficiency, we could improve the productivity of all commissioners' offices by routinely sharing options memoranda prepared by our talented career public servants. All commissioners should be able to benefit from the same advice and analysis enjoyed by our many chairmen over the years. And perhaps we could call this our No Commissioner Left Behind program. <laughs> many, many, many more ideas abound, and I look forward to discussing uh, all suggestions and ideas with you. And, and thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Commissioner McDowell, thank you for your suggestions. And now we, for our final witness, turn to Commissioner Clyburn. We appreciate uh, the time you've taken to engage in this matter with me and others on the committee. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that and for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. It is my pleasure to see you, Ranking Member Eshoo, and the other members of the subcommittee. I respectfully request at this time that my full statement be included in the record. Without objection. My colleagues and I work in an environment with many moving parts. As with any federal agency, there are checks and balances in place, and the regulations and decisions we consider and adopt receive thorough consideration and incredible scrutiny. The Commission staff works diligently on each item with the objective of delivering a finished product that is cogent, precise, and effective. Such complexity often does not lend itself to rocket dockets and express, express reviews, yet the Commission has worked hard to streamline its processing of many items. Other proceedings, however, require a significant examination that takes time and an incredible amount of staff resources. Thus, our consideration of many rulemakings and adjudications can endure over weeks, months, and in some instances, years. Part of the reason why many of our deliberations take so much time is because of our robust and all-inclusive public comment mechanism. During our consideration of a rulemaking item, the Commission listens to any and all comers, petitioners, adverse parties, interested participants, the public, and so on. So criticisms about the FCC being sealed off from the public are inaccurate, I believe, and I am proud of our process and the number of public comments that stem from it. We have made huge strides in putting an enhanced public face 
on the commission under Chairman Denikowski's leadership. Through RebootFCC.gov, our external advisory committees, public forums, and the FCC's numerous workshops, we welcome, expect, and quite frankly need voices and opinions from outside of our walls to provide feedback, criticism, and counsel. This is definitely not your grandfather's FCC. Regarding our much maligned sunshine rules, I have a particular interest in potential tailor-made revisions to the way in which we interact. The introduction of HR 1009 would be a significant improvement in our deliberative process, and I thank Ms. Eshu, Mr. Shimpkish, and Mr. Doyle for this bill. Recently, Nehru, the national body representing state commissioners, praised the introduction of this legislation and offered its support for it. Allow me to bring to your attention the fact that Nehru did note the need for one minor change to the legislation in order to improve its effectiveness with respect to the federal commissioner's participation on the joint boards and conference. The joint boards and joint conference have federal and state representation, and each is involved in the commission's policymaking process with respect to their subject matter focus in the areas of universal service, jurisdictional separations, and advanced services. Under current law, three or more commissioners may not participate in a joint board or conference meeting unless the meeting is open to the public and has been properly noticed. Currently, federal commissioners must take turns participating in our in-person meetings and conference calls. This has made it extremely difficult for the constructive and effective and efficient deliberations when it comes to joint board recommended decisions. Nehru's letter makes the same observation, and I join support of his request that HR 1009 include language to extend the proposed Sunshine Act exemption to cover FCC commissioners who participate on the joint boards and conference. I believe that it is critical that the FCC collaborate with the states on telecommunications and broadband policy. It is my belief that the understanding of local issues must be fully considered and state commissioners know these needs best. When I came to the FCC, my primary goal was to improve the communications and collaboration between our agency and the states. Fortunately, Chairman Janikowski offered me the position of chair of all the joint boards and joint conference. With his support, I believe we have revitalized and strengthened the relationships with the states through these bodies. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for another opportunity to appear before the committee. I hope that the day, today's discussions will highlight any areas of concern that the members of this committee may have, be they process systems, agency rules, or any other methods of practice we use. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. We appreciate your testimony and that of your colleagues on the FCC. I, I want to start with a, a question um, regarding the Commission's agenda. I understand the Chairman, as agency CEO, uh, controls the Commission's agenda. I have a question, though, that a, a Chairman could prevent the FCC from addressing important issues even when a bipartisan majority of the commissioners believes that moving forward is necessary. So I'd like each of you to answer, do, do you believe that a bipartisan majority of the commissioners, other than the chairman, should be allowed to work with the agency staff to move an item? Commissioner, uh, we'll start with the chairman. Well, uh, you know, the, um, uh, having a collaborative process has been important to me from the start, right. as I mentioned, and, uh, and I appreciate the collaborative way that uh, all of us have worked together. I, I can't imagine a situation well, I, I'm going to keep you kind of short here sure. a series of questions. But again, this isn't about you, and it's not about this commission. This is because things have changed. They can change again. So the question is, should you be able to, to uh, uh, be allowed to work with the agency staff to move an item? Should the other commissioners? I, I think the statute uh, now is uh, is correct on this. I think any organization needs um, uh, 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 a chief executive okay. responsible for the prompt. Uh, so it's a no. <laughs> Commissioner Copps? Oh, can you? I like your answer. Can you turn that microphone on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I do. I believe the three commissioners uh, should have the uh, power to uh, call up an item. 
uh, to delete an item from agenda and to uh, edit any and all documents. Commissioner McDowell. Well, this is another uh, boring chapter in the long multi-volume set known as the Cops McDowell Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with my colleague to the right of me, ironically. Um, and um, so, yes, uh, we actually, in all seriousness, in the fall of 08, could have resolved a lot of thorny questions on universal service reform and intercarry yes. compensation because there were four commissioners, two Republicans, two Democrats in agreement, and uh, but the chairman at the time did not move the item. Thank you. Commissioner Clyburn? Uh, we're the sum total of our experiences. So um, in, this, in that regard, um, I have he had healthy engagement. And um, uh, at, at this time, I don't see any need for uh, any revisions in that manner. OK. Um, Could I add just one point on that without taking your time? Sure. 95% of what we do is right. unanimous. Uh, historically, uh, this hasn't been a problem, except for, as far as I can tell, one anomaly. Uh, and so. Uh, I, I personally think that changing the statute to address one anomaly when it hasn't been a problem, I can't imagine an incidence when there wouldn't be three commissioners for um, uh, uh, right. a step that we couldn't work out together. Commissioner Copps? Oh. This reminds me of the old story from history when Abraham Lincoln was meeting with his cabinet to discuss uh, a very sensitive issue, and he took a vote, and uh, uh, there were three, uh, three no's from the cabinet, and uh, uh, and then he voted, and he said, the eyes have it. <laughs> That's why I thought I'd ask the commissioners, not the chairman, and those who have been there during uh, other times. Um, appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, you mentioned your written testimony that the FCC should include proper market power analyses to justify new rules or else explain why such analyses are inappropriate. Could you elaborate on your views, and would you agree that performance measures for regulators should be built into the process for adopting new regulations so that the public can monitor whether the purported benefits of a regulation actually play out. Sure. One, one assumes that if a, a new rule is going to go in place, it's because something is not working in the market. So why is there not something working in the market? So a market power analysis, I think, you know, a proper economic market power analysis, I think, is, is warranted. Now, there may be good reason why a market power analysis is not needed, but the Commission should then be required to explain why it's not doing a market power analysis. Commissioner Cox, do you care to comment on that? Is this in the two-volume set? Uh, I think that's one argument. I, I suppose the, uh, the other side of the uh, argument is that that's why we have uh, notice and comment and uh, the ability of all parties to uh, explain the uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages of, uh, of a situation. I think we should be doing basic economic analysis. I think um, all the cases that I've seen uh, under this commission, we've probably done more of that than we've done in any of the other commissions that I have been a part of, uh, whether you put that in a package and call it market power analysis and differentiate it from all that other stuff. Uh, I don't know. I, I would probably vote to have a little more flexibility than that. Commissioner Kleiber? I, I would be um, open to uh, this, uh, uh, this type of engagement and, and conversation. But to uh, my knowledge, a, a lot of this, whether it's labeled so or not, is happening within the bureaus. So I think we're having the benefit of some of the engagement, even if it's not called that. Okay. Commissioner or Chairman Jankowski. Uh, as a general matter, this is what we do. Uh, the APA requires us to consider all arguments presented to us, and we certainly get arguments about market issues. Uh, affirmatively, it's something we can and should do. There are cases when uh, the reasons to act are different. If it's public safety regulations, disabilities uh, rules, et cetera, it, it doesn't make sense. But in any situation where what we're doing is designed, um, uh, where it would make sense, we do it. We do it as a matter of practice, and the APA would require us to do it. All right. Thank you. My time has expired. I'll turn to my colleague from California, Ms. Eshu, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to um, uh, the Chairman of the Commission and the Commissioners for your uh, testimony and your ideas. I want to congratulate you for what you have already done. And uh, it really should not be skipped over. I mean, I took a look at your, um, at your new um, website last night. I think it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I recommend it to, um, to others as well. Um, uh, first of all, is there, is there anyone on the panel here today that does not support the legislation for um, improving the decision-making process at the agency? Uh, the, the legislation that uh, myself and Mr. Shimkus and Mr. Doyle have introduced. 
Everybody. I would just emphasize uh, two things, if I could. One is the importance of making sure. They'll first tell me yes or no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm supportive of it as long as it preserves the transparency goals underlying the Sunshine Act originally, yes. and I think that's the intention of the statute. Right. And I think the joint board issue is one where I would certainly support uh, a measure that would take care of that uh, issue. Good. It's really a conflict between yeah. two statutes that doesn't make yeah. sense. Well, I mean, in California, we've had the, uh, the Brown Act for years and years that has really uh, I think serve the public interest very well, so I appreciate that. But uh, it's good to know that there's a, a cross the board support. Um, uh, to Chairman Jenikowski, in response to my post-hearing questions from our February 16th meeting, you indicated that a proceeding is underway to determine whether the FCC's special access rules are um, are ensuring that the rates, the terms, and the conditions for special access are just and reasonable. Are there procedural changes uh, in the way that the FCC operates that could speed up this process? I'm not sure there are. I mean, the, 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 we've heard many complaints about the special access area. We take it very seriously, and when we started looking into it, uh, in my time there, we realized that the data that the Commission had was really uh, provided no real basis to actually make a judgment or support actions. Um, uh, but we're in the middle of a process now to collect the data that we need. Um, I think that's proceeding uh, on, uh, on schedule. Uh, I'll, I'll go back and look at whether there are procedural changes that would be helpful to it, but I think we have the uh, 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 procedural flexibility to do what we need to do. Great. And uh, again, to the Chairman, I understand that there's often um, resistance from industry to provide the data necessary to fulfill the uh, Commission's goal of serving the public interest. Um, what are the roadblocks um, uh, to obtaining this uh, data, and, and how can um, uh, we assist you in, assuring, in uh, ensuring that you have the data needed to preserve uh, competition and consumer choice? It, it's an important topic because we, we're all committed to having the FCC be an agency that's about facts and data. You can't be an agency about facts and data without data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what we have tried to do over the last two years with the help of the committee is look both at old data collection requirements that are outdated that can be eliminated, uh -huh. and also make sure that we're getting the data that we need in this new world. And so by removing uh, data, we are showing, uh, I, I hope, establishing credibility that we're focused only what we really need to do. You need uh, us to help you do that? Um, uh, I'm not sure if we need rules changes, uh, but I think your interest in making sure that we have the data that we need uh, and supporting us in this effort is helpful. Good. And uh, does the Commission collect statistics on wireless uh, network quality and reliability? I mean, uh, uh, for instance, uh, do, you, um, do you have data relative to dropped calls? So on, um, uh, on dropped calls, we actually uh, uh, built and distributed an app to begin to get uh, information from consumers about but you their... presently, I mean, uh, so you're just starting that. So we're just starting that. It's a, uh -huh. it's a new thing. It's, I, I agree it's an area we should look at. Good. Um, now Commissioner Copps uh, um, uh, mentioned in his testimony the value of holding uh, field hearings, and I know that there were to examine the, uh, the Comcast uh, NBC uh, merger. Uh, do you plan to hold similar field hearings? Yes, in fact, next or week. Or the, um, eight, well, obviously, AT&T. Mobile uh, in general, we've done a number of field hearings. We'll continue to do them. We'll be in Nebraska next week on universal service reform. Uh, we've but been in many states. Do plan to do them on this gigantic merger? Well, certainly, we, we haven't announced a hearing schedule, so if I could get back to you once we do yeah. that. But, but, but I would urge you to do it because the public needs to, to come to these hearings and understand what's at stake for them and ask you questions about what is going into this decision. They're the ones that are going to be affected by it. I mean, here inside the Beltway, it's like Gossip City. Who said what and how fast it's going and how slow and why and all of that. And it's sexy inside the Beltway. But for people out there, they want to know, how is this going to affect my rates? You know, I agree. These are becoming expensive utility bills. So it's really important for you to hit the road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Eshoo. And just one quick question. There's nothing in statute that precludes you from doing the public hearings you've talked about, right? We, you don't need that from us. Okay. Uh, not, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'd go now to uh, Mr. Shimkus. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks for coming. I'm bouncing between two uh, committee hearings, uh, one with the EPA on rules and regs. So, uh, and I want to make sure that um, you know this is on process reform. So sometimes we will get jumbled into what's going on and think a process reform may solve it, but we really want to stay on what can we do to transparency and the like. So, Commissioner Kleinberg, I appreciated the example, and we did get. Um, uh, email too from Nairuk on on extending that and I and for the life of me I think that's a uh, a good idea and something that should be concluded but it, it gave me the question is for the commissioners and chairman you can weigh in too if you'd like w but the commissioners specifically highlighted uh, our our piece of legislation as being beneficial can you give an example of how how that would be helpful especially uh, Mr. Cops, you've been around a long time. You've probably got a few stories like we did just prior. So uh, what, w give us some real-world application of why you think this would be helpful. Well, a, uh, a joint board example like Commissioner Clyburn was talking about, we'll have a, a conference call, and Commissioner Clyburn and Commissioner Baker and myself are each members of that board. But we cannot be on at the same time. So say uh, Commissioner Baker's on for the first 10 minutes, and then we say, well, Commissioner Baker, you have to get off. Commissioner Copps is getting on, and then it goes back and forth. So you really interfere with and, and retard the uh, uh, discussion. But, but even going beyond that, I just, I just think there's uh, something to be gained by the synergies of having five individual people chosen uh, with five different skill sets vetted by the White House, uh, confirmed by, by the Senate, uh, to come to the Commission, uh, and, and just having them sit down in a room together. And I think some of the personality uh, conflicts that we've had in previous uh, commissions probably, um, I don't want to over-dramatize uh, them or anything like that, but I think things would have gone better and been more easily resolved and more of the spirit of compromise and collegiality would have attended uh, those issues had we been able to do that. I just I don't understand why we aren't able to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so to go back to that fall of 08 example with the Universal Service and Air Carry Compensation, uh, where four commissioners, again, two Republicans, two Democrats, uh, agreed on some fundamental reforms, it would have been nice if all five of us uh, could have gotten in a room, or three of us, uh, uh, to uh, try to uh, figure out why that wasn't moving. Um, and so it, I think it would speed the process. Um, I think it would be more efficient. Uh, as Commissioner Kopp said, it would uh, uh, breed more collegiality. And keep in mind that our work product ultimately is public uh, and appealable to the courts if someone doesn't like it. So, you know, transparency is still there. Uh, Commissioner Clavern? Yes, uh, coming from a joint uh, board perspective, you've already um, heard how inefficient um, uh, the, the process, the, the current a process don't worry about is, those. oh okay I, I, that usually means something in, in these parts um, but uh, you know to give the public some um, you know assurances or some some more comfort in this um, when we talk about the joint board and joint conference joint boards and joint conference experience the the recommended decisions from these bodies are not final they're recommended decisions and they're presented to the FCC and then at that point there's a notice um, you know, the, the process of noticing goes into place, and then and only then, after that is exhausted, do uh, the, the, the that comes to the FCC in terms of uh, for a decision. So these are not final; just recommended decisions are not final decisions. They go through processes. So the public should feel some comfort. But this uh, this disconnect that we have is something that does not lend itself for a good exchange. Great, uh, Chairman. Would you want to weigh in, or? Can I sure, I, I, I agree that the joint board situation is a problem that should be fixed. All right, thank you. Le and let me just go on another process reform, and it's kind of the, the age-old argument that people uh, raise capital, assume risk, need some certainty whether to either produce or to withdraw from the, from the market. Uh, some people have proposed uh, issues like shot clocks as far as timelines, minimum review periods after the close of the comment cycle. Anyone want to talk about that? And I only have 34 seconds, so if you could do it quickly. I'm happy to do it. I think in general, shot clocks can be an effective management tool. They're one of the tools that we use. Uh, I, I, I think uh, preserving flexibility is important, but I think it can be an effective management tool. Commissioner Copps? I would agree. I think sometimes the uh, 
shot clock, such as accompanied uh, the Calm Act that we're looking at now, do uh, do mandate that we we take action. Uh, again, I think this commission is is doing a good job. Uh, uh, generally on this score, so I don't know that we would have to uh, uh, mandate it unless uh, the problems got a lot worse. I do agree that business needs uh, uh, certainty, but I, I think that comes more from the uh, substance of the rules than the, uh, uh, than the process and having a clear idea of the rules that they're going to operate under. It's up to you, Chairman. I'd like to have the final two. Let, let, let's hear from the other Commissioner. Commissioner McDowell. I think shot clocks can be very helpful. I've long advocated them. Uh, I do agree with the Chairman that uh, we need to preserve some flexibility. Things can go wrong. Sometimes we get a shot clock from Congress uh, with the Calm Act or the Telecom Act of 96, but internally we probably could use more. In principle, I am not in disagreement with shot clocks, but I think should, they should be treated as guidelines and not be allowed to rule the process. Thank you all. It's good to see you. Yield back my time. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, we're now going to go to Dr. Christensen uh, for the next five minute round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome to uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and the uh, commissioners. Um, from the outset, I want to make it clear that I know that my question regarding FCC's review of mergers and transactions is an issue of authority and not one of process. But it's clear that Congress created a strong public interest mandate for the FCC. As Commissioner Copps noted, the words public interest appear 112 times in the Communications Act. The FCC has clear statutory authority under the Act to conduct its public interest evaluation of mergers and transactions, and the courts have conferred great leeway for the agency to fulfill these public interest duties. Commissioner McDowell, I wanted to ask you whether you agree with the statement made by Commissioner Baker in March that the FCC has, and I'm quoting here, clear statutory obligation to closely scrutinize transactions and reject those that violate the Communications Act, FCC rules, or fail to serve the public interest. Yes, I agree with that. And um, do the, does everyone agree with that statement? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Chairman, uh, Janikowski, uh, why do you believe that the FCC should have jurisdiction over transactions? Why wouldn't DOJ or FTC review be su sufficient? Well, the Communications Act uh, uh, makes it clear that the FCC must approve transfers of communications license and find that they're in the public interest in order to do so. Uh, uh, communications is something of importance to every American. It's a sixth of our economy. They involve complex technical issues where uh, an expert agency is important, uh, uh, other goals and values that are enshrined in the Communications Act, uh, and that has been our system for, for many, many years. Uh, and um, uh, it's important to make it work effectively. Thank you. Some have complained that re in reviewing some of the mergers, the FCC has imposed conditions that are not transaction specific. For example, during the review of the Comcast NBC uh, Universal transaction, conditions involving broadband adoption and diversity were, um, were uh, imposed. So uh, do all of you believe that those com conditions are merger specific, uh, Chairman? Uh, yes, and if I could just add one word. Uh, the statute requires uh, the FCC to make a determination that a transaction is in the public interest. And so it's not surprising that companies, as they come to the FCC and file for approval, uh, make the case for why a transaction is in the public interest and point to specific public interest benefits. Uh, with respect to some of the benefits, given the potential harms of some transactions, it becomes important to make sure those commitments uh, are binding. Uh, Chairman, Commissioner Kopp? Yes, I uh, I agree very much uh, uh, that uh, transactions are perfectly within uh, t conditions on transactions are perfectly within the purview of uh, the commission. I know there's a, an argument uh, whether they should be uh, company specific or uh, uh, products of industry wide uh, rulemaking, but uh, you know, it's a hard line to, to draw. Some of these transactions, like uh, Comcast and NBC, are paradigm shifting, they change the whole industry. So it's very difficult to make a, a clear division uh, like some people would have us make. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, I do not believe uh, conditions should be imposed that are not uh, merger specific. Uh, I think in that particular transaction there were a number of conditions or voluntary commitments that were not merger specific. Uh, it might be evidence of a good corporate citizenship or evidence that they uh, wanted to try to sweeten the deal for the FCC's approval but it had nothing, some of them had nothing to do with uh, the merger itself. 
And uh, uh, Commissioner Clyburn? Uh, I uh, agree that uh, in terms of the uh, public interest standard that the FCC is uh, basically mandated uh, to do that. Uh, and we're the experts in this space. We and not only are required to look at competition, which is solely DOJ's um, uh, purview, but we have to look at the, the public benefit, and that includes a number of uh, uh, benefits as well as harms, and we have to weigh those, and conditions are sometimes warranted uh, to answer those. Okay, and um, let me just ask a question of Chairman Janikowski in my last few minutes. Um, you talked about holding a po public forum on reducing barriers to broadband and band build-out, and uh, we really commend you for the, all of you for the forums that you've held. And these events are important to the successful implementation of BTOP in states and territories like, like the U.S. Virgin Islands. So are there some barriers that you have identified to broadband build-out, and is there technical assistance that FCC would provide to overcome any of those barriers? Mr. Chairman? The, uh, there are barriers. Some of the barriers that we see are barriers that slow down infrastructure companies, wired and wireless, from building out quickly or that add costs. Uh, we took some steps in this area around a uh, tower siting shot clock. To come back to the shot clock concept, we uh, adopted one. Uh, we think that there are, we took steps in this area also with respect to pole attachments, which will help reduce barriers and lower the cost of broadband build out. Uh, we're very interested in hearing from industry and stakeholders on other uh, barriers uh, that would be appropriate to address. Uh, one that's been brought to our attention are challenges around uh, co-locating antennas on existing towers and unnecessary delays in that process. So that's something we're looking into now. Thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the questions and answers. And now I'll turn to the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, Commissioner McDowell mentioned an article by Randolph May, and Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit that article for the record. I agree with the Commissioner. I read it, thought it was very insightful. Without objection. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to speed my questions up. You all have been very patient. Chairman Jenikowski, I want to ask you, looking at the process you followed on net neutrality, I want to ask you about an, a Fortune magazine article that um, you have affirmed in that article two different times that net neutrality rules were already in effect. So are these rules in effect? I, I think I may have been making the point that uh, on a bipartisan basis before I got to the commission, the commission had enforced net neutrality rules uh, uh, against companies uh, where they weren't rules, which was part of the problem. I, well, I hate to interrupt you, but I think what the questioner, the reporter had said, that means they're law. These are rules that have been written and are in effect, and your response was yes. And what is interesting to me is that the FCC hasn't published the order in the Federal Register yet. So my question would be what justification could there be for a six-month wait or a delay unless the FCC is seeking further delay um, and legitimate rules by the courts or by Congress. And I, I, I understand your question now. Uh, the rules are not in effect yet. They require publication in the Federal Register and they have to go through an OMB process and a Paperwork Reduction Act process. These are not our processes. We are well, complying I think with it, processes yes, and I pushing agree. them as and I as think it would be appropriate to get our policies published in the Federal Register before we start implementing new rules, especially since the impact that those rules are going to have are, in my opinion, going to be damaging to the innovation and growth of the Internet. Let's look at the Comcast NBCU order. It states that Comcast and Comcast NBCU shall comply with all relevant FCC rules adopted by the Commission in GN docket number 09-191, and I'm referring to the FCC's Open Internet Order and its unique application, this specific on the merger conditions. Does the FCC believe that even if a court overturns the FCC's decision that Comcast and Comcast alone will still be subject to these extrajudicial rules, and where does the FCC get that authority? So the answer is uh, yes, and the authority comes from uh, the language uh, obliging us to make a public interest determination in approving transactions. 
This was a merger-specific um, uh, enforceable commitment uh, that flew, flow, came out of the fact that this was uh, a, tr a merger between the largest broadband company in the country, one of the largest content companies. We heard from many businesses saying that a specific harm from this transaction could be favoritism of co some content over others. Does, does the FCC have a responsibility to answer to the Article Three courts that by law review the, review the FCC decisions? Of course. Okay. Um, all righty. Um, let's talk about copyright. Copyright protection, I support it, and I've supported voluntary cooperative efforts among the ISPs and the content community to address infringement. And given the language specifically in paragraph 107 and 111 of your open internet order, your, what assurances can the FCC give to the ISPs that they can enter into voluntary agreements with copyright owners to address these infringements online without running afoul of the net neutrality order? My recollection is that the, the order uh, says uh, pretty much that, that the uh, rules apply only to lawful content, not unlawful content like stolen intellectual property, uh, and that uh, voluntary agreements uh, to uh, uh, make enforcement of IP laws um, uh, effective is something that's not prohibited by the rules. Well, I have to tell you, I think it would be helpful for the FCC to provide the company's assurances that if they have, that they have reasonable discretion to implement steps to address copyright infringement, and I hope that you will do that. I've only got 19 seconds left. I did have another um, um, question about broadband pricing, but I will submit that one for a written we, response. We may do a, we're going to do a second round. Well, so. I've got a plane that's going to leave without me. They've promised to do that if I'm oh, not there. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I'm thank sure you, your Mr. submission Chairman. of a question will we'll get an answer from each commissioner. So. Yes, thank you, sir. That. Thank you. Y'all back. Um, we'll now go to uh, the other side of the aisle. Mr. Doyle has been kind enough to yield to the Chairman Emeritus of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy and I thank you for the recognition. I want to thank my good friend from Pennsylvania. Many, many courtesies I have had at his hands. Thank you. Um, welcome to the Commission. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to express some distress at the delay in publication of the Commission's open internet order in the Federal Register. I understand, and, and clearly so, that this delay is more appropriately attributed to the Office of Management and Budget than to the FCC. Moreover, I wish to note for the record that the order was adopted on, on December 21, 2010, and the order's text was released to the public two days later on December 23. And I want to commend the Commission for this display of transparency. There is, however, another type of delay that deprives the public of a thorough understanding of the Commission's decisions. And it does, I think, afford a marvelous opportunity for rascality. This is the delay that can occur between the time when the Commission adopts a report and order and the date on which the text of that report and order is released to the public. A delay of this sort enables the staff to make revisions to the order in the dark of the night. It enables petitioners to seek and obtain tweaks in the agency's language. It is a decision making that is subject to the charge that it is potentially the source of perhaps dishonest decision making that ought not exist at the commission. This type of delay has been the subject of this committee's attention in the past. As the chairman and I were discussing yesterday, some 20 years ago, in May of 1991, I engaged in an exchange of letters with the then commission chairman, Al Sykes. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the, that the copies of that correspondence be entered at this point in the record. Without objections or ordered. With this history in mind, I'm going to direct this question to you, Mr. Chairman Genahovsky, um, and I'm going to ask you if you would please do exactly what I asked Chairman Sykes to do in an earlier time. Would you please provide this committee with a list of the committees of the Commission's decisions where the text of the decision was released more than 30 days after the Commission 
announced its decision together with the best explanation you can make for the delay beginning on January 1, 2010. Would you do that for us, please? Uh, yes, I will, and I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, the, uh, that period, we have closed in the last two years, that period from an average of 14 days to three days, and in most cases, it uh, releases one day after commission adoption of the order. Thank you. Now, I recognized that the 30-day period, which was referred to in my questions, is arbitrary. And it does not respond either to statute or regulation. It does seem to me that a delay of 30 days or more does provide opportunity for impropriety. And I would urge the Commission to comment on this opinion for the record, especially uh, in view of all of our desires to improve the transparency at the Commission and this committee's ability to conduct rigorous oversight. Now, in the case of decisions whose release is delayed for 30 days or more, does the Commission commit at this time to providing this committee with a written explanation of the delay and a projected date for the release? Yes. Now, I want, I want to make it clear the, we, have to, we have to make a selection here between two situations, the first of which is where the Commission releases the decision, and there is, there is a delay between the time that, that the matter is then um, made final. There also is a situation, and this I know afflicts the Commission substantially, and that is that you send things over to the Office of Management and Budget, which duly forgets that you are an independent agency of the Congress and insists that these matters be held up over uh, whatever qualm the administration might have in the matter. So in any event, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, I thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy to me, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his questions and his uh, willingness to work on these issues to improve the processes at the FCC. Now I uh, turn to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Jenikowski, uh, this is a question for you, if you can uh, recollect this. Uh, I think we've already talked about the Commission's backlog. Uh, how many petitions or applications are currently pending before the Commission? That's a number I don't have in my head, but we will get it for you. Would you say, can you guess, give a, just approximate range? Uh, you know, um, when we do financial disclosure, the, we have a range. There, there, there are many small ones um, uh, of a sort where the number is, uh, I, I wouldn't even have, uh, the, the, the number is uh, uh, in, in the thousands, not in the tens. Do you have uh, staff behind you that might know? These staff, are, that's what they're paid for. They're texting somebody right we now. Will, we will get an answer within, uh, within five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then the other question is, uh, how many more, how many of these are more than six months old? Uh, and that's another question that I can't answer off the top of my head. Okay. How many are more than two years old, five years old? Do you think any, more, any of them are over two years old? Uh, I think it's possible that some of them are. Any of them over five years, you think? Uh, is that possible? I, I don't know, but it's possible. Okay. Uh, we've heard that parties with a transaction before the FCC sometimes feel pressure to curtail their advocacy in unrelated proceedings. Uh, I guess the question is, fundamentally, do you agree uh, that uh, every constituency should be free to advocate before the Commission without any pressure? I think that's just... Absolutely. And, and if I could, can I say one word on the previous question? Yeah, it's because, you know, I hear all the time that people are totally intimidated by you folks. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I don't know. and, you know, I can understand why, because a decision by you folks is not just a hundred dollar decision. I mean, billions. I mean, it's just, and uh, so that you have this much power. So the question, they come back to me is that a lot of them are intimidated. And so they just want to have the free to be an advocate uh, before the commission without pressure. Uh, well, in this question, I think, you know, the Commission has an obligation to base each decision that it makes on the issues before it, on facts and data, and uh, uh, we're, we're all very committed to that. Uh, on the previous issue, there's an area for reform here that I'd just like to mention briefly, which is a, a lot of the backlog comes from uh, applications for review 
of uh, relatively routine bureau decisions that are made. Um, and um, because of uh, uh, um, uh, the APA, sometimes it's thought that it requires the commission to do its work all over again in order to address it in advance of litigation. And we've been exploring some reforms uh, here to speed this up and to help eliminate the backlog that relates to applications for review from bureau orders. And that's something I'd look forward to working on with you in the committee. Okay. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, um, I think you touched upon on your opening statement and I looked at some of your letters that uh, you've written uh, in the past. Um, the FCC's transaction review standards, I think, are vague and, and sometimes susceptible to abuse. For example, parties with a pending transaction should not feel pressure to accept voluntary conditions on the deal. The Commission can also leverage its merger review process to adopt conditions that it could not otherwise impose through a transparent and public rulemaking. I, I guess the question for you is how can we narrow uh, the Commission's authority to simply address these concerns? Well, that could come through a statutory change, as has been, has been pointed out today already. It's a, there's a large, ambiguous public interest standard by which we review mergers. Uh, but if a statutory provision were added to say uh, any conditions or voluntary commitments um, extracted from the merging companies should uh, be specific, specifically tailored to a consumer harm that arises uh, out of the merger, and perhaps uh, look into maybe sunsetting them. Uh, once market conditions uh, obviate the need for any further regulation. Mr. Chairman, if you wanted to add to that at all. The, the uh, um, Communications Act, Congress has placed an important responsibility on the FCC to make a public interest determination, to find that a proposed transaction is in the public interest. Uh, and it's something we take very seriously, I think all commissioners do. Uh, uh, it's understandable why companies would uh, suggest the public interest reasons uh, uh, for a transaction. Uh, sometimes there are specific potential harms that emerge from a transaction that in order to approve the transaction, it's necessary to um, uh, uh, impose conditions. This uh, has happened under uh, Democrats and Republicans at the FCC. And it's okay. Go ahead, please. My last uh, question, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it's Commissioner McDowell again. Uh, I'm concerned that the FCC has been regulating in areas without first clearly identifying its own authority to act. From VoIP obligations and net neutrality to broadband outage reporting, the FCC has fallen into the habit of proposing rules without first uh, trying, tying those rules to the authority given to it by the Communications Act. I know every bill that I have to drop, I have to show constitutionally that that bill complies with the Constitution. So what pra best practices would you recommend going forward based upon what I just told you? Well, you know, the Commission uh, in areas where I've dissented uh, certainly has made legal arguments uh, justifying its legal authority. So I, I can't think of a, uh, an item that uh, just didn't have a legal argument. But as, as lawyers know, there are legal arguments that are colorable and there are legal arguments that are winnable. Uh, and so uh, this is, you know, fine grays of distinction sometimes. It's, it's hard to say how, you know, how do you keep the FCC to act within its authority uh, other than you know, read the statute and the plain meaning of it. Mr. Chairman, anything you might add? Uh, uh, two points. I would note that um, in, the, in the last few years, uh, the, the FCC's record in court on statutory challenges has been overwhelmingly positive. I, I don't remember the number in my head, but I will get it to you, but overwhelmingly successful. Uh, the second thing is um, uh, we do, when there are colorable questions of authority, uh, we seek comment on that uh, in the notice and comment stage. We did it yesterday. Uh, in looking at updating our network outage rules to protect the safety of the public in event of emergencies. Uh, there's a colorable question about authority. We will be looking that carefully in the record. Um, uh, 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 it is uh, vital that we move forward on public safety issues like that. Working together with the committee, if we don't think we have the authority, we will come to you and ask for the uh, authority. Uh, but uh, getting a public record uh, and asking our terrific legal team to focus seriously and honestly on the authority issues is what we try to do. Thank the gentleman from Florida. Now I turn to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, welcome to the members of the commission. Uh, let me just say at the outset that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with each and every one of you, and uh, I've appreciated your hard work and dedication. Uh, all of you are, are very good members of the commission. Uh, Commissioner Copps, I know your term is expiring this year, and I just want you to know that if I were the benevolent dictator of the universe, 
as scary as that thought may be, <laughs> your term would have no expiration date. Thank you for your service to the commission. Uh, you've been one of the best ever. Um, now, Chairman Jendikowski, you know, I can't pass up the opportunity while I've got you all here. Uh, as you know, just recently, the House and Senate uh, and, and the President signed into law the Local Community Radio Act last year, and this is uh, legislation that's going to open up uh, the airwaves for hundreds of new low-power radio stations across the country, uh, including community radios throughout the, in cities like Pittsburgh and all across the United States. Chairman, uh, I want to ask you, and I'm not trying to sound impatient here, uh, I know the Commission's working on it, but I just want to make sure that the draft rules are going to come out uh, by the end of the spring, or could you give us uh, a sense of the timing on this? Uh, 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 first of all, congratulations on the passage of, leg of the legislation. Uh, uh, bipartisan, very important, uh, and we are working to implement it as quickly as possible because we think it's a real achievement and will really help in local communities. Uh, our media bureau is working uh, on it. Uh, uh, I will uh, redouble my efforts to make sure that it happens as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to piggyback on, on top of uh, some questioning that uh, uh, Anna Eshoo talked about with special access to. Uh, I've always thought that name special access is a misnomer. It should be called critical access. I, I note that your broadband plan agrees with that. And uh, I, I have real concerns uh, of, about the affordability of these lines as Report after report comes out, whether it's the GAO or the National Broadband Plan or others, that indicate that the sellers of these lines are continuing to overcharge their competitors. And, and quite frankly, the FCC, uh, it, it's, it's been rather frustrating uh, it, to, to get you to address this, this question. Uh, it's taken quite a long time to come to a decision on the matter. And I'm just trying to understand, you know, what's causing this delay uh, and when do you think that you will obtain the information that you need to finally bring a vote to the commission? And please don't tell me as soon as possible. <laughs> Can you give me something more definitive to that? Well, m my frustration was that when I arrived at the commission and we started to look into this issue, the, the paucity of data that the FCC had was very <coughs> troubling. Um, uh, uh, there's no point to doing something in this area that's not based on a record, that's not based on facts and data, and that wouldn't be upheld in court. Uh, uh, and we also didn't want to put out uh, a broad data request that one would be uh, burdensome on industry, but even more important, would not be manageable for us because it's a very complex area. Uh, and, 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 and our team did, I think, a fantastic job uh, working in um, a, a focused way to identify the data that we would need to be able to make a determination uh, on whether there's an issue uh, that requires us to act, uh, and if so, uh, what an appropriate action to take would be. Uh, we're still in that process. We've completed the first round of data coming in. The staff is analyzing that. Uh, we'll continue to work with you on it, but I agree with you on the importance uh, of this issue, and we're working very diligently on it. And, and so can you, you know, nec by next year, by 2030, uh, I mean... Well, uh, you know, uh, w w well before that. I completely agree with you that Well before 2030? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I agree with you. I can't say because... Um, we're analyzing the data, and I don't want to prejudge it. I want the staff to do its job as fast as it can because it is an important issue that goes to competition uh, and broadband deployment. Mm -hmm. Do any other commissioners have a comment on special access? I, I think it's important for us to get to a, uh, a final resolution. When you're talking about a market that's uh, approaching tens of billions of dollars a year, and you add in there however many years this has been pending, and you're thinking, are companies going out of business? Is competition being disrupted? So it really uh, uh, instills in me kind of the same sense of urgency that you have. Yeah, Commissioner McDonald. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been at the Commission almost five years, and it's sort of like Groundhog Day on special access. Uh, we're coming up actually on the fourth anniversary of Congressman Markey's letter to the Commission insisting that we have some resolution by September of 2007. Uh, it's now 2011. Uh, really what we need, as I've been saying for almost five years now, is a cell site by cell site, building by building map with price terms and conditions of all providers of special access, uh, the competitive providers as well as incumbent providers. Uh, this isn't as hard as it seems. Uh, the DOJ gathered this data in 2005 during the uh, Bell long distance mergers. Um, and uh, it, it's really not as daunting as it sounds. Uh, legally, there might be an issue as to whether or not you can compel certain companies to provide that data. Yeah. Um, and that's where the problems have been, is that a lot of companies know 
uh, that they don't have to provide the data, it might be competitively sensitive, things of that nature. But if you go to an industry trade show, uh, business to business, a trade show where they're, they're buying and selling special access circuits from each other. So all the sales guys have all this data. It's not that hard to find, I don't think. Uh, but that would give us, uh, let's get a real-time snapshot of what does the market actually look like. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, where uh, there's more competition in a, in a market, um, uh, we ought to uh, deregulate. And if there's not enough competition, then we need to figure out what to do. Commissioner Clyburn. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, one of the first meetings that I took uh, as a commissioner dealt with special um, access. And when uh, these same parties see me, they look at me and we don't even have to exchange words. So I, I agree with you uh, about the urgency. I agree with you, especially being from a rural state, that um, this um, is a, a, a significant barrier uh, for uh, enhanced service. Uh, so um, I, I am uh, looking forward to continuing to working uh, with the chairman in order to uh, get resolution here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesy. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, your work on these issues, Mr. Doyle. Uh, we're going to go a second round. I know it's going to take up a lot of time on my side of the aisle, but uh, hopefully we'll get through this. Uh, there are a couple of things uh, I'd like to go through. Uh, first, the top seven best hits of our memo. Um, some of the ideas we kicked out there, and I, I doubt we'll have time to get through them all. So I would, I would draw your attention to the, the uh, staff majority memo if you have it. Uh, if not, if you can just give us your feedback on these seven items. And look, from the outset, I'm not trying to lock you into stupid restrictions. I'm just trying to figure out is there a way to, to put in statute good things, some of which Chairman Janikowski has already enacted as chairman or put in, you've codified your rules, so that regardless of who's chairing this or regardless of the personality dynamics that may occur five, eight, ten years from now, the good processes are there for the public. And so um, I, I throw that out. So the notion just, and I'm going to, I know this doesn't work well, but sort of a yes, no. The, the concept with flexibility built around all of these of trying to go to notices of inquiry before NPRMs. Does that make sense? Does it not make sense? I mean, should that be kind of a, a rule? Uh, Commissioner Clyburn, do you want to, I'll just go back and forth. How's that? I think when, oh, yes and no, huh? Um, I, I think when the commission needs more information, then yes, it's warranted. But we are in the information exchange business. We have n uh, public right. notices and the like, and so we get a lot of information. So when it when we need more information, then yes. But in the case where we don't, when we have sufficient information, information, I think right. it would delay the Commissioner process. Commissioner McDowell, yes, with flexibility that can't be abused. Got it, Commissioner Copps. Uh, yes, usually, but uh, always remember there are crises and emergencies, right. and terror attacks, and things that demand expedited exactly. action when you can't do that. Right, Chairman Jankowski. I would say, as a general rule, we do it. There are many exceptions. It might be a statutory mandate. It might be it's a further notice. Uh, it might be a court remand. Okay. It might be that we have enough information to proceed. I, I, I'm not sure that a statutory change is required. Okay, that's fair. Publishing the proposed rules. You don't always publish the text uh, for public comment before adopting the final rules. Should uh, the, the proposed rules always be published ahead? Chairman Jankowski? Uh, yes, that's, no? that's been our policy. We've gone from 38% right. to 85%. Uh, I think Any reason not to go to 100? Uh, there, there are some cases uh, where uh, it might be a, a form or it might be a further notice where the rules are already out or it might be we're seeking comment on uh, a third party's proposals. Uh, our practice is we always need a good reason uh, in order not to publish yeah. proposed rules. Mr. Copps? You know, sometimes people don't get serious about we're doing something until you get beyond the, uh, into well into the NPRM stage, and then, then they get serious and tell you what, uh, what they like. So it's not always practical to uh, uh, do that. New data comes in, and again, I'd say flexibility for emergencies and things like that, but I would commend the uh, Right. Uh, chairman on the tremendous difference we made in making sure that uh, we do that now over 85 percent of the time. Mr. McDowell? Yes, with flexibility that can't be abused. Commissioner Kleiber? Flexibility that takes into account any type of public um, comments. And Got it. What about minimum comment periods, statutory minimums for comment reply cycles? Does that make sense? Mr. Clyburn? I think uh, if there are statutory obligations involved, there might, there might be problematic uh, with our uh, video uh, uh, relay, um, assess video accessibility act. We had a six month window. So if you had certain obligations that might uh, uh, impede that uh, progress. So um, again, flexibility and dexterity are, are my two words for the day. Okay. 
Commissioner McDowell? Yes, with flexibility that can't be abused. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Cobb. Same uh, uh, right. response. Uh, I agree as well. The real issue is uh, 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 making sure the Commission pursues best practices and, and, and look forward to working with you on that. All right. What about shot clocks? Uh, parties in the public should have some sense of when resolution would come. Hard shot clocks or shot clocks as a report card mechanism? Gives you the flexibility, but you maybe report to Congress on your rates of uh, trying to achieve those shot clock numbers. Again, I'm not trying to tie your hands here, but uh, you know, I think there are issues in the past in some cases where things dragged. I, mean, I talked to a group recently. They've had a, a petition a rulemaking for six years at the commission. It was circulated last fall, I believe, and is still in somebody's inboxes. So, shot clocks. I think shot clocks can be an effective tool. We're using it. It may make sense to use uh, more shot clocks, uh, and we are looking at that, and we look forward to looking at it with you. Commissioner Cops. Yeah, man. Shot clocks helped break the UNC Chapel Hill monopoly on basketball, so I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I don't think we're going to... I always come behind him, and it's always problematic. But anyway, all, tra <laughs> <laughs> all transactions are created equal. So, again, guidelines but not ruling the process is, is, is I think wise. Okay. What about publication of final draft? For an item scheduled for an open meeting, the FCC could be required to make the final draft public a certain amount of time in advance so everyone knows precisely what the commissioners are being asked to vote upon. I think we go to this end. I, I think I, I've always been troubled by the logical impossibility of this because uh, there's a draft, there's more input, the draft changes, it gets put out again, uh, and you end up in something where it's actually impossible for the agency to act effectively. The, the APA process is designed to do this do a notice, put out rules, get comment, the agency deliberates, makes a decision, it's subject to further review. I think that general process works. People should know generally and, uh, and have a clear idea, but you can't keep doing this uh, time and time again until you get the last T crossed and the last I dotted. At, at some point we have to be in the phrase of uh, well-known person as the deciders on, uh, on these issues. More often than not, it's a good idea. I would not want anything to uh, stifle any type of exchange uh, that could possibly take pay place and an improvement of an item. Yeah. I guess what draws me to this one is what we did to change our house rules to require a three-day calendar day layover mm -hmm. so that everybody has a chance to see it. Um, and sometimes that's inconvenient if you want to cram something through. But it is the public's business, public process. That's all I'm talking about. You know, that it would seem to me you'd want them to see the final product and a little time comment. Uh, if, with the indulgence of the committee, if I could just go through the uh, remaining couple of items here. Uh, commissioner, initi uh, commissioner initiation of items. Chairman, CEO controls the agenda, but what about having a bipartisan group of commissioners be able to weigh in and put items on? I know we probably went through this earlier, but just for the to see if, 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 if Commissioner Clyburn has been swayed <laughs> by the incredible weight and evidence that's come out during the hearing. Thank you for notice. <laughs> Um, I, uh, you don't want to be able to help set the agenda with a really no, awful I think, bad I think, chairman. I think I'd, I'd do that. I'd, I'd like to th I, I have that type of, um, you know, rapport. So uh, that's why you did not yeah, do You it. weren't there in the old days. Commissioner McDowell. <laughs> yes, I supported this kind of concept when uh, I was in the majority on the commission, and I support it today. Commissioner Copps. Uh, I would just repeat what I said. I think three commissioners ought to have the uh, ability to put an item on the agenda, take an item off the agenda, and edit the agenda. And the and chairman has the item. I, I, uh, as I said, I think nothing's broken. 95% percent of our decisions are unanimous. Uh, we work collaboratively, and I can't imagine a situation where there would be a problem. And there's only been really one anomaly that I'm aware of historically. All right. I, I'll, I'll uh, stop with that. There are some others here that, uh, that I think you all have this. The committee's been very kind to let me kind of work through those. Uh, but we would, we would like your feedback on them. As we say, we kick these out as discussion points. Some of them are going to make sense. Some of them aren't from a statutory standpoint. Some of them you can go about and do, and you are, and we appreciate that. Uh, I would turn now to uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, the always colorful Mr. Markey. Uh, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. And, um, yeah, as intended. Uh, and, the, um, uh, and welcome all you know, uh, uh, here today. Uh, we're at an historic uh, juncture. Uh, there is now an announced plan by AT&T to buy T-Mobile for $39 billion in the latest in a series of major transactions at the uh, commission. 
uh, for you to remove, uh, to, for you to review pursuant with your authority. Uh, the merger would reduce the number of national uh, wireless companies from four down to three. Uh, and then uh, the next step would be the inevitable gobbling up of Sprint by, by uh, Verizon. So we'd be back down to two, uh, which would be uh, kind of going into the telecommunications uh, uh, time machine back to uh, 1993, you know, before this committee wisely decided that um, the, um, the, um, the two companies that had all the licenses, one of them was the progeny of, of uh, AT&T, all the regional companies had one license, you know, and, uh, and uh, other people had the other one, Macaw, significantly, but it was 50 cents a minute. Uh, it was uh, analog. It was, uh, it was not a particularly uh, robust marketplace, and people did not have cell phones in their pocket. So I thought it would be good if we look back at the myths of mobile time uh, so that we can understand where we were, how we got here, and why we really don't want to go back at all. This isn't even an open question uh, because we had more than enough time to learn how big companies view how fast you can move in the deployment of, of uh, mobile technologies. So uh, back here in October of 1993, on a bipartisan basis, it was a beautiful thing, uh, the general disgust that this committee had with the lack of progress in, in the mobile area led to us moving over 200 megahertz of spectrum for the creation of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth license. Uh, you two big boys, you really don't need any more unless you, it's in a market where you're not in right now. Okay? So that was kind of our message. Um, they weren't particularly happy with it. Matter of fact, the general who ran all spectrum for the federal government, for the Defense Department, he wasn't happy with it either, but we told them all, figure it out, you know, do your best. Uh, but we need that spectrum. We need a robust marketplace. We want to move and be uh, number one. And so we had this incredible breakthrough, and we moved from 50 cents a minute. Within four years, it was under 10 cents a minute. All of the companies, including the two incumbents, had to go digital, which is much more versatile. Uh, and, uh, and it was quite a, quite a transformation. If you can imagine, here's where we were <laughs> when we passed the bill. We had this brick. We had this brick. Uh, anyone remember carrying this around in your pocket? Uh, Do you have that? You know, that this is the brick. And by, uh, by uh, 1996, we had moved to BlackBerry. Brick to BlackBerry. Huh? Four years. This committee, a lot of insight. Those first two companies, they really didn't think that they wanted to move that, this fast. Matter of fact, they told us in testimony they couldn't move this fast. It just wasn't going to be a general consumer product, you know? They were targeting businessmen on mountaintops, I think. So that was it. So, uh, and again, their message was don't uh, regulate. So the question is, do we want to turn the clock back to that duopoly? Uh, do we want to go back to the brick in terms of how fast companies are forced to innovate? Do we want to trust those two companies again uh, to move faster, you know? I don't think we want to do that. I think it would be an historic mistake for the FCC to approve this merger. I think we would go into a telecommunications time machine back to that point in time. We've already got AT&T uh, and Verizon pretty much dividing the country into, into Bell East and Bell West, you know, which is the plan. Um, uh, letting them have a national wireless duopoly is what is at stake here. Um, so. I've seen the movie before. I know how it ends for consumers with them being tipped upside down and having money shaken out of their uh, pockets. We are the ones in this committee that made sure that we ended that era. Uh, and I think it's critical for the FCC to apply its own very brief history on this subject. You know, this is not something where we have to go back to Alexander Graham Bell. There are people within our own lifetimes that you can go back. They're, they're still alive. They were here in 1993, you know what I mean? And, and they can still be consulted as to what the state of that marketplace was. But all I can tell you is it would be an historic mistake to go back to that time. 
with the promises that come from two behemoths, you know, that uh, they will continue to innovate. History tells us after 100 years from Alexander Graham Bell up until 1993, they do not innovate. And that's the key. It's innovation. It's investment in new technology. And it's paranoia-driven Darwinian competition that ultimately leads to the changes that help consumers and competitors. And I hope you all keep that in mind as you're going forward, because this is going to be the biggest decision you make. And I hope you make the right one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I would remind members of the committee we have to be a little careful since this is a decision before them when it comes to the Pillsbury rule and all. Uh, I would now. Uh, the Pillsbury time right now? Back to the blackberries. <laughs> Excuse me? Was that a question? No, they're going back to the blackberries. Uh, is, is that a question? Are we in the Pillsbury? I know we're, we're are we constructed, are we constructed in our committee hearings from expressing our views I, on, how, on a merger? Not your no. views. No. Yeah. And I'm not an attorney. I think there are issues. We were, it was suggested in another hearing in another context with an issue before a commission. Right. We have to be careful in terms of how we, how we convey our thoughts is all I was told. Well, I am a lawyer. And, um, and I won't hold I, that against and, you. And, uh, and I think there are lawyers down there. Um, we have... You know, so uh, can, right. can the staff, this, 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 I think the staff is packed with lawyers. Are we in the Pillsbury uh, time frame right now? Okay, oh, good. That's why I said they're going to their BlackBerry. Okay. Good. Meanwhile, uh, we'll proceed and go to uh, Ms. Eshu for five. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while the lawyers are going back and forth, uh, I don't know a time where members cannot express an opinion. Um, Mr. Markey is not asking the commissioners for their thinking on the matter that he just raised. He expressed his, com uh, his, uh, his opinion. And so, um, uh, God help us if uh, members of Congress can't come in uh, as members of a committee and express an opinion. Um, I understand that there is, um, uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Markey's opinion may be menacing to some, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, or discomforting, but, uh, but it's, it is an opinion. I think it's an important opinion. And um, uh, whether Pillsbury or anything else gets in the way here, uh, I'm not a lawyer to make that determination. But I, 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 don't think that's the, I don't think that's the question, most frankly. Um, let me see. Um, Chairman Jenikowski, some uh, have expressed uh, concerns recently that the FCC has shied away from uh, using a notice of inquiry, you know, to first examine a broad set of issues uh, rather than proceeding straight with the proposed rules in, um, in a notice of proposed rulemaking. Do you think that proceeding with uh, notices of inquiry can be an effective approach? And um, have you employed the NOIs more often under your chairmanship compared uh, uh, to previous um, administrations? We have used NOIs frequently. I think about half of our notices of proposed rulemakings have been preceded by NOIs. And often, especially when it's a new issue, a fresh issue, it's a good place to start. When we're dealing with a statutory mandate to implement something, when uh, the commission has vast experience coming out of prior proceedings, um, when there are real timeliness issues around perhaps public safety, then NOIs might not be the way to go. And I think we try to be thoughtful about, with each proceeding, how to get the balance <coughs> right between uh, developing a full, inclusive public record mm -hmm. and moving in an expeditious manner for the public and all stakeholders. Uh, but do you believe that an NOI uh, must proceed um any uh, proposed uh, rulemaking? I, I, I don't think that it, it, it is now a requirement or should be a firm requirement. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm, I don't have any other questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I do think that, um, if I might, um, the list of uh, suggestions that you had today, your punch list, that we have the commissioners all respond to them. Yeah, I actually asked them to do Good. that. Good. Okay, yeah, I, I, I agree. didn't hear that. But I, I think it would be helpful to, uh, uh, after you've given some uh, some time to give some thought to it, uh, that we hear back from each one of you on them. 
Okay. Thank be you helpful. very, very much. Uh, turn now to uh, Mr. Doyle if he has any further questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of eating lunch, I have no further questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, then, I want to thank uh, both our committee members who participated so uh, well in this uh, committee hearing, and especially the FCC commissioners and the chairman. Thank you for your thoughtful approach to this. We look forward to uh, continuing to work with you in a cause I know we share, which is to continue to improve. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman before you conclude, has the commission staff been able to identify whether or not a Pillsbury? Not, not yet, but I'll let you know as soon as I can. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, thank you. Okay. You want us to wait until they get an answer, or can we go ahead and adjourn? I well, think we'll go ahead I, and I, adjourn. I, I, I think it's, you raised the issue, and, and it was in the uh, aftermath of my comments, and I just wanted to know if my congressional prerogatives uh, are in Look, any yeah. way, are in any way uh, um, contradicted by any uh, prerogatives of the FCC. And if they are, I, I want all the members of the committee to know how we are all restricted uh, in terms of our um, Recommendations, Re to recommendations to the commission, and uh, and I just don't want the committee hearing exactly. to end until that is established because that is quite a quite a statement made to me that I no am. now let me it, let's not overtake what I said okay what I said was I just would caution the committee this is an issue before the commission and we have to be cognizant of these rules this was not a criticism of what you said and we each have the opportunity to express our views that is not about that and i was i shouldn't uh, this was not about you this is not about what Matt Eshoo said we will probably have a hearing on this issue and and and, 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 and rightfully so i just know in a different subcommittee with an issue before the Na nu nuclear regulatory commission that is before them we were advised not to try and affect the commission's decision in that process because it's something before them. Is the intention, so this was in general context, that's all it was. The general, if the gentleman would yield, is the intention of the hearing which you are going to have to in any way affect the decision made by the FCC? Not if it violates the Pillsbury rule. No, you're saying, you're saying if it does not violate the Pillsbury rule, do you know if that hearing will violate the Pillsbury rule? I won't hold it until I find out the answer to that question. Okay, I, I think that's an important thing for you to say. And we each you, have the so right. rather than saying you're going to have the hearing, you should say I, I'm going to have the hearing if it is not a violation of the Pillsbury hearing because I don't want any member of this committee to influence uh, the way in which any member of the FCC thinks. Okay, and if that's the, the, our position going forward, I can live with that. Uh, and in fact. Um, if that's our committee policy, then I would like to have that established so that I go, go, know go. that and every other member knows that. Yeah, yeah, slow down. Take a breath. Here's the deal. I am not the person who <laughs> made slow. this a, accusation that there is a potential I, Pillsbury violation. And I, nor I, did I. Yes, you did. No, I, that was not my intent. That I'd be happy the, to go that, back that and was, look. And well, let me put it like this. It was the effect, I, if not the intent, it had that effect. All right. This was not my intent. If it was a... Assume that way, I take that back. That was never my intent. I'm just trying to do something cautiously here and not get anybody in any trouble. And when we have a hearing, we might not have the commissioners before us. If they're not before us, I think we're pretty open to what we can say. Right? That's all. This was that's all it is. And with that, um, no other business come before the subcommittee. We are adjourned.